Good morning, early birds. How are you? <laughs> You're like, well, seriously? Why are you so chipper? Well, it's not Monday. That's that's a good reason to be, you know, more chipper. Not Monday. It's Tuesday. We get blah on Mondays. But on Tuesdays, we're like, hey, we're here in the classroom. Hey, hey. That reminded me of somebody who does that. Some comedian, where are we in the classroom? Right here, hello. I gotta pull on my cushions if it starts raining and it looks like it might start raining. I was gonna get, I wanted to get on here and look at me, how, how am I on time? What up? I know. Look at what I'm saving for you for tomorrow. All kinds of little dirty things here. <laughs> no. No, we leave the dirty things for the dirty people. Look at this. You're like, what is that? That is, see, I'm going to get them all wrong. Is that the stamen? Or is this the stamen? And this is something else. I don't know. But that is from the lily, right? You're like, I don't know, Dr. Farrowich. I'm just gross. Look at that. See, I'm going to probably have new flowers tomorrow. And early birds, you didn't see, but I have the video. I, I have a video on this. Um, not for you right now. Tomorrow, I'll get you the video. But look at these flowers. Coming out of these green pom-poms. I'm going to try and do this again. I don't think I did a very good job the other day of keeping it still for you. It still isn't very still. It's some. It's hard. But look at that. Look at those flowers popping out of there. It's so beautiful. Let's get started, shall we? We have got, um, what did I say I was going to go get? Something. I was going to bring the cushions in because it's going to start raining and then I'm going to have to run. But I'm going to do that. I'm going to run. I'll run and get the cushions in if I have to get the cushions in. Right now, we're reading. Because <clears throat> we still have quite a, well, kind of about one quarter of the book left and that's significant. If You Lived with the Cherokee by Peter and Connie Roop, illustrated by Kevin Smith. Let's keep going. So, how did you hunt and fish was the last question. So, remember that? Blow darts? I do. I put that up in a video this weekend. In fact, blow darts. I did. Watch it. Fishing was another important skill. You might use bone, you might use bone hooks or box traps made of cane to catch trout, catfish, and other fish. There was seven, there was even a way, there was even a way to get fish without using a hook or trap. First, a dam would be built across a stream. Then horse chestnut juice would be put into the water. The juice put the fish to sleep. You would wade in and pick out just the fish you needed. Then the dam was knocked down. The running water broke up the remaining fish, which swam away. Oh my gosh. All right. Horse chestnut juice. Where do we get that to put some fish to sleep? All of a sudden, we, we we don't build a dam over here. We just put it in the in, in the lake over here, right? And then all of our fish are like, <laughs> maybe we shouldn't let out that secret, huh? Horse chestnut juice. Put fish to sleep and you grab the ones you want. Wow. How about that? Were there special hunting ceremonies? Yes. When hunters were going off on a big hunt, the whole village took part in animal dances. These dances were held to make certain that the hunt would be successful. There were different dances for different animals. The beaver dance and the raccoon dance acted out the hunting, killing, and skinning of those animals. The buffalo hunt dance was performed by men and women acting like bull and cow buffaloes. The bear dance was a fall favorite. The Cherokee believed bears had once been human and were eighth were the eighth Cherokee clan. Wow! Remember each 
Each tribe had seven clans. Remember that? And the bear apparently is the eighth clan. Because of the Cherokee belief that animals had their own spirits, it is important to show respect for their lives. Before man could hunt, he had to pray to the animal spirits and ask permission to take their lives. If there was trouble, I think that that, is, that, that shows a lot of respect for life, right? That it shows respect and it also shows how, how important people believed that life is, no matter, no matter, right? No matter if it was an animal or if it was a human being, how much they believed life was so important. If there was trouble with the hunt, the people believed something had gone wrong with their ceremonies and prayers. So the belief in a higher power and showing a higher power glory and honor has been part of the of human existence no matter where we were, right, on this planet. And no matter whether or not people had uh, our Christian message or whether they had learned it from their families and tradition, there is widespread belief that you give honor and glory to God. Some people believed in more than one God. Some people believe in only one God, monotheistic versus, I think it's pantheistic. In early times, Cherokee men hunted only for the food and skins they needed to survive. After the new settlers came, they hunted more beaver, more bear, and more deer for skins to trade. Animal skins were in such great demand that in one year, the Cherokee traded over a million deer skins. Wow. Wow. A million deer skins. Wow. Wow. How did you make and, and then and then they did all that work to get the deer skins and trade them and yet somehow they didn't have enough resources to keep their land. How did you make a canoe? You needed a canoe to fish or travel on many rivers. You would use a dugout canoe. A dugout was a canoe made from one long log. The best wood was poplar or pine. First, the tree would be cut down and the trunk shaped to a point at each end. Then fire was used to hollow it out. The dugout canoes were made in many sizes. Small canoes held two people. Large canoes could hold 15 to 20 people. Imagine how big that tree must have been, right? Some even held 35. You would use a long pole to push against the river bottom to move your dugout. Most dugout canoes were too heavy to be carried, so they were kept on the same river. I guess as you were fishing and hunting. If you had no canoe and had to cross a river, you would build a raft from a bear or buffalo skin. You would tie the legs of the skin together at each end to make a raft. You would put the, your belongings on top. Then you would swim across the river, pushing your raft through the water. Hmm. I don't know what Lucy's all bothered by. I'm looking here to see if it's starting to rain. Lucy! Let me just... What's the matter, honey? She doesn't like the neighbors either. She doesn't. <clears throat> Which is not very nice to not like neighbors. Oh, look. Blur. Shh. Lucy. Apparently, the workers took a week off. Hmm? I had to regroup. I'm still here. <laughs> you don't think that's true? It is true. How did you get around in the forests? The lower mountain... So here, we, so I, I want in case you're not seeing the picture, there is 
uh, Cherokee pushing his raft of belongings. That was um, from bear or buffalo skin. So it must not get wet, right? Here's the canoe. They're using fire. And, and obviously the inside of the canoe would turn into ash, right? And so you'd be able to get all of that tree out of there. So that's interesting, isn't it? That Here we go. Whoop. Here we go. And the other picture here is trading, right? A million deer skin one year. I do really like these pictures a lot. Thank you, Kevin Smith. And let's see here. Here's the fish hooks made out of bone. And then here is special hunting ceremonies, right? Okay. If I can't see that, then it's, I think it's hard for you to see that. So I always have to look to see if I can see it. How did you get around in the forest? The lower mountains and valleys were crisscrossed with trails. Many of the forest trails were made by deer and other animals. Thousands of Cherokee feet made the trails smooth near the villages. The trails connected all of the Cherokee villages. Many led to the lands of other tribes too. Some trails were very long and ran for miles through the Cherokee ch territory. The Great Warriors Path ran north to south through Cherokee country. The Cherokee and other tribes used the Great Warrior pa Warrior's Path for swift raids against their enemies. The high mountains were very rugged and there were few trails. All right, so they, they didn't have trails on. In the, in the, in the mountains, they had them only on the lowlands then. Did the Cherokee ride horses? What a good question. Horses were not much use in the mountains where the Cherokee lived, so they were not as important as they were to the Sioux and other Plain Indians. The Cherokee did have horses. People today talk about a breed called the Cherokee Pony that may have been raised in Cherokee villages. Who were your enemies? I'll let you see that picture there. Your greatest enemies were the neighboring Choctaw and Creek, but you might also fall the you might also fight the Chickasaw, Shawnee, and Seneca. War played an important role in Cherokee life and American men's males' lives as well. Men and women could be warriors. It would be up to you whether to go to war or not. No one could make you fight if you did not want to. Warriors usually went to war to seek revenge for the death of a clan member. After a war dance, you and your companions would walk single file through the woods to your enemy's village. You would call to one another with your bird calls or other animal noises. Once you had taken your enemy by surprise, you would kill only as many of the enemy as they had killed of your clan. Then you went home. However, your enemy would want revenge and attack you again. Then you would attack in return. Sounds like the United States. To prepare for war, young Cherokee were made to endure cold, pain, and hunger. They had to listen politely while respected warriors told of their past deeds. No, they were probably interesting, weren't they? But just, uh, just like us, we have to listen to old people's stories too, don't we? <laughs> like mine. It's not funny. Old people's stories, whatever. We're doing this for grammar. Don't forget. That's the reason why we read. And don't forget, did you take care of yourself? Did you eat breakfast? Did you brush your teeth? Eh, didn't get this fixed yet. Eh, wah, wah. I was looking at older videos, a little bit older videos that I had uh, to edit. And my teeth look so nice. It's so disappointing when something like that happens. To prepare for young, the Cherokee were made to endure cold, pain, and hunger. They had to listen politely while respected warriors told of their past deeds. If you were a good warrior, you might earn the title of Raven if you were a boy or beloved woman if you were a girl. 
The Cherokee people were involved in many wars Europeans fought for control of America. In 1754, they sided with England against the French. In 1776, they fought with the English against the Americans in the Revolutionary War. In 1781, after the Americans won that war, the Cherokee had to give a large amount of their land to the United States. In the War of 1812, which we talked about in the bookless classroom, that was the French and Indian War here in the United States. The Cherokee helped General Andrew Jackson defeat the Creek, their longtime enemies. The Creek fought with the English against the Americans and the Cherokee in that war. Without the Cherokee at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend, General Jackson might have lost. With their help, he won. Never again would the Cherokee have to fight the Creek. Yeah, never again would the Cherokee be around. Thanks, Andrew Jackson. That's what he learned. Trail of Tears from Andrew Jackson which we've read in this classroom, right? So we learned that. Or did we? No, we read it in the bookless classroom. Trail of Tears is what we read. Great, awesome book from um, Cornerstone of Freedom, although I don't like all their books. I don't like that one by L. I. Mayer. Did the Cherokee scalp their enemies? No pictures here. Yes, but they did not do this before the Europeans came. They learned to scalp from the Europeans. Even then, they rarely scalped an enemy. The Cherokee used war clubs in battles. So thanks, Europeans, for teaching them to scalp people, to collect that as war trophies, scalps. The Cherokee used war clubs in battles. They made three kinds. One was a stick, about three feet long, with a large knob on the end. Another was a short club with deer antler spikes. The third was a club with a sharp rock on the end. The brave warriors got to wear an eagle feather in their hair as a sign of courage. To earn his feather, a boy would have to be brave in battle. He would have to do a courageous or dangerous deed in front of others so they could see just how brave he was. When the new settlers came, the Cherokee began using guns. They replaced their stone knives and clubs with steel knives and tomahawks from the Europeans. So an Indian with more than one feather is probably then has more than one feather, obviously, because he's very brave. And the chief, who has a whole uh, head of, you know, feathers... I all of a sudden can't I think of what that's called. They'll probably, hopefully they'll tell me. Is obviously a very, very courageous warrior. Did you go to school? You would not go to school in a building, but you would be learning all the time. Your parents and relatives would be your teachers. So, so it's, I think it's kind of like maybe what we should be moving to today, where you have a teacher here who's here for, you know, three days a week on a lot of different subjects for a lot of different ages, but the other four days you work with your parents and, and your brothers and your sisters and you explore and learn outside, right? You would learn Cherokee history by listening to older people in your village tell stories. There were stories about how the Cherokee people were created or why a possum plays dead. They told the story of the first three Cherokee named Kanati, Silu, and Wild Boy. Other stories told the Cherokee ancestors brave deeds. Cherokee stories were fun to hear, but they were also taught but they also taught lessons about good behavior and good manners. Kind of like our stories today, right? A lot of our stories, not all of them though. Some of them teach us how to not be very nice or have manners. Did you learn to read and write? The Cherokee had no written language until 1821 when the Cherokee syllabary was created by a chief named Sequoia. A syllabary is an alphabet that is made up of sets of syllable, syllables rather than letters. So, and a syllable is the breaks in a word, right? So, tomahawk has three breaks. Those are syllables. Here is the Cherokee syllabatry, which I just happened to look at and see. So I turn to the back to show you. So 
So kind of interesting, right? Actually very interesting to me. Okay. Sequoia saw that the new settlers had paper with writing on them. The papers rustled like leaves and talked to people through written language. He called them talking leaves. How interesting is that, right? When he saw these talking leaves, Sequoia decided the Cherokee must have talking leaves too. For 12 years, he worked hard making talking leaves. First, his daughter, Ioka, Ioka, helped him draw hundreds of pictures, one picture of each word in Cherokee, but it was too hard to remember what every picture meant. Then they decided to make a symbol for each Cherokee sound. They took letters from the English alphabet. They created some letters of their own. Together, they made the Cherokee syllabary. The Cherokee syllabary had 85 characters, one character for each sound in Cherokee. Once you learn the characters, you could write anything in the Cherokee language. Many Cherokee learned to read and write in only a few days. Wow, Sequoia, you're smart. You're very, very smart, Sequoia. Soon after Sequoia made the Cherokee syllabary, the tribe painted its own newspapers in English, printed its own newspapers in English and Cherokee. Today, Cherokee children learn to read and write in English and in Cherokee. Some even use a computer that speaks Cherokee. Sequoia and Ioka were the first people to have made up a written language all by themselves. They were the first people to make up a written language all by themselves. We don't have the history of our written language, but the, but the Cherokee do. How interesting is that? What's going on here? Sequoia and, Ico and Ioka were the first people to have made up a written language all by themselves. The toy Sequoia trees in the largest in the the largest in America is named in Sequoia's honor. So the great big redwood trees in California are called Sequoias, giant redwood trees named after this Cherokee. Here are some Cherokee words written in the symbols of Cherokee syllabary. All of the symbols of the syllabary are shown on page 79, which we saw. This is the written word, which means ama, which means water. This is a written word at, at sadi, which means fish. This is the written word for lugvi, which means tree. And this is the written word for sequoia. How did you worship? The Cherokee were religious. You would believe in spiritual beings who created the earth, sun, moon, and stars. You believe the eagles, rattlesnakes, fire, smoke, corn, quartz crystals, the sun, the moon, and the number seven were all sacred things. You know what my license plate is? BPT777. It is. I love it. And we believe that 777 is uh, is the number for Jesus, right? 777 or 77, not 777. That's my license. <laughs> seven is the number for Jesus, for perfection. Or is it one that's perfection? I can't remember. But we think of the number seven as not only being lucky, but being holy as well. Religious priests guided the Cherokee. Priests were singled out in childhood. Twins had an especially good chance of becoming priests. If you were picked to be a priest, your training was different from that of your friends. You would be taught how to use herbs and medicines. You learned how to use quartz crystals and sacred ceremonies. Quartz was a special rock for the Cherokee. In every council house, a large quartz crystal was kept with other sacred objects. I wonder what the significance is for quartz because lots of people now also use quartz crystals um, even Americans do, right, in some spiritual ceremonies, but I don't really know what they mean. Yawa. What? Yawa? That sounds like Yahweh to me. Sounds like we all have the same God. What? Look at that. That's the name of, or great spirit was the one supreme Cherokee God. The Yawa, which sounds like Allah, which sounds like Yahweh. What? Did you look at that? 
Look at that. That's crazy to me. Crazy incredible. Why wouldn't God have the same name? He made them all. Why wouldn't he have the same? Why wouldn't we recognize his name everywhere? The Yoa was so sacred that only a priest could say the name out loud. Kind of sounds like our God, right? It's why the whole Bible says Lord instead of Yahweh, right? Or Allah. That's right. It says Lord. After European Christian missionaries arrived in their land, many Cherokee became Christians. The Cherokee belief in the Great Spirit made it easy for them to believe in the one Christian God. Of course it did. Oh. <gasps> Amazing, amazing, amazing. What would you celebrate? Festivals were held every year. These festivals celebrated important seasonal events. There were many different kinds of food. There was music and dancing, red wooden water drums, and long gourd rattles kept steady beats. Carved cane flutes played melodies. Dancers with leg rattles made the tortoise shells move made of tortoise shells, moved in circle. Shaka shaka, shaka shaka went the rattles. You danced until you were too tired to go on. Now that sounds like a party. That you danced until you were too tired to go on. The first new moon of spring was celebrated in March. The green corn dance was in August when the young corn was ready for tasting. The ripe corn ceremony was held in September when the corn was harvested. The friendship ceremony or Atahunu, Huna, Atahuna, was held in the fall. This was a time to forget grudges and to build friendships. Homes were cleaned, old household things were burned, new clothes were made and worn out clothes burned. Then then the family fire was put out. That's That sounds a lot like, kind of like the new year, right? Atahuna was a time to begin a new year with new things and new feelings. A new sacred fire was started with coals from the old fire. Embers from this fire were carried to each home to relight the family fires. Atahuna lasted seven days and nights. There were dances every night. Men, women, girls, and boys danced for love, friendship, and new beginnings. A special, we don't have anything like that for a celebration for, for everybody. Nothing, nothing of a celebration for the whole community any longer. Something, something very important lost. A special dance, the booger dance, <laughs> that's what it says, I'm sorry was enjoyed by everyone, especially their children. Men traded clothing with a friend and put on scary wooden masks. The masks represented enemies, evil spirits, or creatures. The men would burst into a home or the council house pretending they were enemies and do silly things that made the enemy look foolish. At other times, the men danced around a fire acting like clowns as the children tried to guess which was their father. The chief dance was a festival held every seven years. That's amazing. Every seven years was also the um, jubilee in, in, in the Jewish religion. You see how the laws are written on our hearts? We just don't celebrate them any longer. What happened if you got sick? The Cherokee, let's see here if I, if I looked at the picture enough. I think that we did. Here, here are the men who are acting like children. Surprise, surprise. In their masks, dancing around and acting foolish. We love you, though. We love you. What happened if you got sick? The Cherokee believed that sickness was caused by animals seeking revenge for the harm people did to them. They also believed that plants were the friends of people and would fight sickness, and it does, right? It's the reason why companies like Shackley are trying to steal all the um, uh, secrets that came from the ancient Orient and and uh, uh, from our ans our our um indigenous ancestors here on this land. Every plant has special healing powers. The plant told the Cherokee, I shall help man when he calls upon me in his need. This is how Cherokee medicine began. If you got sick, your mother or grandmother would care for you. She would find special plants to make medicines to help 
make you feel better. The Cherokee had 400 plants they used for medicine. If the medicines did not work, she would get the village medicine man. He would say special prayers for you to drive the sickness from your body. He would also treat you with his plant medicines. When a person... Looking to see if it's raining yet. When a person died, the body was put in a coffin and buried. The Cherokee believed your spirit went back to visit all of the places you had lived. Seven days after a person died, a dance was held to speed the soul of the person on its way. The grave was not visited for fear it would bring bad luck. Wow. They didn't visit the graves. Hmm. What games did you play? Boys enjoyed a game called hawk fighting. To play, two boys crouched down facing each other. Each boy put his knees under his chin, then grabbed his legs with his arms so he looked like a ball. A friend put a, a long stick under his knees and arms. Each player tried to tip his opponent over. The first to get tipped over was the loser. Oh, that sounds a little fun. Chunky was another favorite game for boys. To play, a stone disc was rolled across a flat field. The players, armed with spears, chased the disc. The players threw their spears at the stone. When the stone stopped rolling, the player whose spear was the closest got two points. Almost a little bit like golf. Not quite. You needed 100 points to win. This game was not only fun, but it taught the boys how to throw spears better. The basket game was a favorite game for children. Six white beans and a basket were needed. Each bean had been burned on one side and left white on the other. The six beans were tossed into the air and caught in the basket. If all the beans landed with the white side up, you got three points. The basket game was enjoyed during long winter nights. Sounds like Yahtzee. A little bit like Yahtzee, doesn't it? Listen... Did we look at the pictures there? So there's the basket game, and, and there they are throwing spears for the um, chunky. Listening to stories was a favorite activity. Your parents and grandparents would tell you funny stories and serious stories. They would tell many animal stories, such as how the wildcat caught the gobbler, or why the possum's tail is bare, or how the deer got his horns. They would tell tales of how the world began and how the Cherokee got fire. Many of the stories had lessons that would help you be a better person or teach you to be a better warrior. Stories about the little people were taken very seriously. The little people stood three feet tall. They spoke Cherokee and lived in the woods wherever the Cherokee lived. The little people liked to play tricks. If an object such as a spear or knife was found in the forest, the Cherokee believed it belonged to the little people. It was said that if you saw a little person and told about it, you would die soon. That's strange, isn't it? Like leprechauns. That's a little strange. Were there any team sports? A nesta or stickball was a major Cherokee sport. Long ago, stickball games were frequently used in place of combat with an enemy. The men from two opposing tribes played the game in the square in front of their cheering families and friends. Sometimes 50 men were on a team. Using short sticks, the small baskets at one end, the players tried to hurl a small deer hide ball past their opponent's goalpost. The first team to score 12 goals won. So that sounds like soccer. Stickball was rough and tumble. The opposing players hit, kicked, pushed, and sometimes even killed one another to stop points from being scored. Sounds like a foul to me. Uh, that was a that was a foul. Oh no, what happened to George? Ah, that was a big foul. Stickball was called the little brother of war. The losing team frequently lost large areas of land to the winning team. That is a serious soccer game. No wonder. <laughs> For They're still serious about it. 
For fun, men for fun, men and women and boys and girls played a played a game like stickball. The females played against the males, each side trying to hit a pole with a ball. The men and boys could only throw the ball with sticks. The women and girls could use their hands to throw the ball at the goal. Afterward, the feast a feast and a dance celebrated the fun of this friendly game. The modern game of lacrosse came from stickball. Today, stickball remains an important Cherokee social and religious event. Look at that. Look at that. Look at those sticks, just like lacrosse. Very cool. What happened to the Cherokee when the United States was formed? After 1783, the United States government wanted the Cher Cherokee and other tribes to live the way other Americans did. The Cherokee were supposed to become farmers to own land, to learn to read, write, and speak English. Many of the Cherokee did. The men learned to become farmers instead of hunters. They owned cows, pigs, horses, and sheep. They rode in wagons instead of cutting wood with, their, with axes. They took logs to Cherokee sawmills. They owned stores, ferries, and blacksmith shops. Some wealthy Cherokee even owned black slaves, like some white farmers did. The Cherokee women learned to spin wool instead of tanning deerskins for clothes. Cherokee children went to Christian school, church schools. The Cherokee began a new kind of government. They wrote a Cherokee constitution modeled on the, on the Constitution of the United States, which was adopted in 1781. They elected men to the National Council, which made laws. So there's the Cherokee kind of acting like, like we do. They had a Cherokee police force called Light Horse Guard. They created the first Native American free public school system, which all Cherokee children had to attend. But not all Cherokee liked to see the old ways disappear. They wanted their children to remember the ways of their ancestors. Many of the Cherokees moved deeper into the mountains to avoid contact with white Americans. What was the Trail of Tears? We know what the Trail of Tears was, right? It was 1838 that Cherokee were told by the United States government to move west of the Mississippi to the Indian Territory, part of present-day Oklahoma. New settlers wanted more Cherokee lands, especially after gold land had been discovered on them, and that was in Georgia. When the Cherokee refused to move, the United States sent 7,000 soldiers to force them out. The soldiers dragged families from their homes, not giving them time to gather their belongings. Why would they when then they could take their belongings afterwards and steal them and loot? The Cherokee stood helpless watching as new settlers took over their homes. They were then forced to live in special fenced camps where many died from the filthy conditions. The many treaties the Cherokee signed with the United States government should have protected them. But the treaties were ignored. The Cherokee took their case to the United States Supreme Court, the highest court in America. There they won the right to keep their lands. But then a law was passed to move the Cherokee to their Indian territory anyway. The Cherokee had to leave their homeland. President Andrew Jackson, who the Cherokee fought for against England, basically said uh, they won their right to keep their land. Make me enforce it. Make me police that so that they get their land back. He said he wouldn't, is what he said. He won't, he wouldn't police it. He would not enforce that law. So they would never get their land because he would never make the police give them the land back or the army give them their land back. 8,000 Cherokee went by boat down the Tennessee River to Ohio. From the Ohio River, they went down the Mississippi and finally up the Arkansas River to Indian Territory. The 17,000 Cherokees still left in camps began the long march to Indian Territory. With them, they carried coals from the sacred fire. Some of the men, women, and children began marching in June. The rest left in fall and winter. Some rode on horses, others in wagons. Most walked. The Cherokee were hungry and thirsty. Many got sick and died from measles, whooping cough, and other diseases. The dead were buried in shallow graves along the trail. Which meant that their bodies could be uncovered by, you know, weather, wind, 
and that would have been a tragedy for them, for their families. Heads down, the Cherokee marched west. Through the freezing winter, they marched. Few had warm clothes. Food was hard to find. Many more Cherokee died. They marched through Tennessee and Kentucky. They crossed part of Illinois. They crossed the icy Mississippi River. They kept going through Missouri and a corner of Arkansas. Finally, they reached Indian Territory. The terrible journey lasted six months. One out of every four Cherokee who started the march did not finish it. Over 4,000 Cherokee died along the trail. The Cherokee called the trail Nuna del Ulsunyi, or the place where they cried. It is also known as the Trail of Tears. Not all of the Cherokee went west that year. Many Cherokee hid in the mountains until the soldiers were gone. There they lived much as their ancestors had, hunting, trapping, fishing, and farming. Today they are called the Eastern Band. They live in the Kuala Boundary or Reservation in the Great Smoky Mountains of North Carolina, the heart of ancient Cherokee country. What is it like to be a Cherokee today? The Cherokee who reached the end of the Trail of Tears began new lives. They built new homes, farms, and schools. They built the town of Tahlequah. Today, Tahlequah in Cherokee County, Oklahoma, is the capital of Cherokee Nation. Here the Cherokee government meets. The leader of the Cherokee Nation is a chief elected by the Cherokee people. The chief works with a council of 15 members to make decisions for the Cherokee, just as councils did long ago. A woman or man can be elected chief. In, a, in 1985, Wilma Mankiller was elected the first woman chief of the Cherokee. Oh, not happening yet here in the United States for a woman president. Cherokee beat us. Many of the streets in Tahlequah are named for Native American tribes. You can walk down Cherokee Avenue, Delaware Street, Shawnee Street, Chickasaw Street, and Choctaw Street. Many of the streets have Cherokee names, such as Kitawa. The signs are in Cherokee and in English. There are 186,000 Cherokee living today. They are the second largest group of Native Americans in the United States, after the Navajo. About 11,000 Cherokee, the about 11,000 Cherokee, the Eastern Band, still live in a tiny part of the same land where their ancestors in the Great Smoky Mountains where their ancestors lived in the Great Smoky Mountains. Most Cherokee lived in the Cherokee Nation in Oklahoma. Both bands of the Cherokee have their own schools and businesses. Many Eastern Cherokee make a living using the old Cherokee skills of basket making, carving, and beadwork to create things to sell to tourists. Others work in local businesses or on farms. Many Western Cherokee farm or work Many Cherokee, many Western Cherokee farm or work in factories, making everything from rocket parts to cabinets. Both bands of Cherokee are proud of their Cherokee heritage. Each has a museum telling the story of its band, as well as a Cherokee village built in the same way as the villages of their ancestors. Both perform summer plays telling their history. The Eastern Cherokee perform Unto These Hills and the Western Cherokee perform Trail of Tears. Both Cherokee bands work hard to make a good life for themselves and their children. As in the days long past, they work together to take care of each other and to help one another. I heard there's a lot of artillery um, that's buried. Our tanks, our cannons and things built on the reservations there in Oklahoma. In 1884, there was the first reunion of the Eastern and Western Cherokee since 1838. 30,000 Cherokee celebrated their traditions and culture. Coals from the sacred fire were carried west along the Trail of Tears, were mixed with the coals of the Kuala Boundary. A new sacred fire was lit from these coals, a fire that will burn as long as principal people walk the earth. This is an interesting thing about that fire, that their sacred fire. That's the reason why some um, of our um, ancestors here used to, and, and on the planet, used to sacrifice people to the fires, right? The, the Aztecs used to sacrifice people to the fires in order to keep the fire burning. If they didn't sacrifice people, the fire would go out. 
That's interesting. So the same sacred fire burning. It just fascinating. This is Dr. Annette Fairovich. Thanks for joining me here in the early bird classroom. On next Monday, we're going to find a new book, but we are going to have questions from the Cherokee. So could, we can do a little review of everything that we learned from the book if you lived with the Cherokee. Thank you, Peter and Connie Roop and Kevin Smith for those great illustrations. All right, so a new book starting next Monday. Tomorrow, we have an hour-long math and science. We're doing an hour-long math and science on Wednesdays. This is Dr. Anna Farovich. I'm the teacher. Thank you so much for joining me here in the classroom.